I want to welcome you to uh, my study. Uh, we're going to spend some time together in this video as a part of a series of difficult passages in the Bible, uh, studying in the book of First Peter. I hope that you'll have your Bible with you, the Bible you use for your own personal study. Perhaps you can make some notes. Perhaps you'd like to have a piece of paper so that you could make some notes if you'd rather not write in your Bible. We're going to try to explain primarily what the text says. Uh, the interpretation of the text is another matter, but the first step is to try to understand how the text functions and try to understand exactly what is being said. In order to uh, set the stage for our study of 1 Peter, uh, I want to uh, observe that we can identify three basic sections uh, in the text after the salutation of uh, chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. The first part uh, I would identify as moving from chapter 1, verse 3 to chapter 2 and verse 10. I would call this the new identity of God's people. It has to do with holiness. It has to do with the blessings that God has prepared for those who faithfully serve him. It's our call to Christian maturity. It's a call to paying attention to God's word. It's a text that uh, describes uh, God's plan for the church and that we might be living stones, uh, that we might be a holy people. Uh, that we might be royal priesthood, a number of descriptive phrases, a new identity for God's people. There is a hinge verse in chapter 2, verses uh, 11 and 12, uh, moving to part 2, uh, which is the matter of obligations, various kinds, civic obligations, obligations in the context uh, of the government uh, as uh, slaves uh, to uh, uh, owners, uh, also uh, husbands and wives, obligations in the home, obligations in daily relationships, uh, chapter 3 and verse 8. Finally, all of you uh, should uh, live in harmony one with another. Uh, and that would bring us to uh, the third section of the book, part 3, uh, which has to do with endurance and trials. And as we look at chapter 3, verses uh, 13 through 17, the point of the text uh, that is being made uh, in this uh, in this part uh, of the Bible. Uh, let me turn over. I'm using the commentary that uh, I have written, the notes that I have uh, prepared uh, in order to uh, get, guide us in this study. But as we come to 1 Peter chapter 3, uh, and we look uh, beginning in verse 13, the point is that uh, it's not likely that Christians would suffer significantly for righteousness, but when that does happen, that they will nonetheless uh, be blessed. It's not common, but it's possible. Suffering for righteousness uh, would not occur frequently. E examples of suffering for righteousness would be limited in number. But to understand the possibility and that God's uh, part uh, in those times when we suffer for righteousness does not mean that he has abandoned us. Um, it is to show us then the example of Jesus Christ. So in chapter 3 and verse 18, Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous. Certainly an example of unjust suffering uh, in the context of First Peter to bring you to God. He was put to death in the flesh and made alive in the spirit. Chapter 4, verse 1, Therefore, since Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same attitude. The one who has suffered in the flesh is done with sin, so that as we live in the flesh, in our lives, we do not live for evil human desires, but for the will of God. This is the reason for the preaching of the gospel, that uh, even to those who are now dead, that they would be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the spirit. Uh, looking at that reading 3.18 and chapter 4 verses 1 through 6, one sees five occurrences of this phrase in the flesh and also multiple occurrences of this phrase in the spirit. And we begin to grasp something of the purpose of Peter uh, in this section. As we read and we moved from 3.18 directly to 4.1, uh, you may have noticed we skipped over 319 through 22. I did that for the specific purpose of trying to illustrate the function of chapter 3, verse 19 to 22 is somewhat parenthetical. And so it is the description of how God works in the midst of those who have died in the flesh but live in the spirit. Um, the uh, four Christ um, has suffered 
uh, for Christ died for sins once for all, chapter 3, verse 18. Uh, that connector, hoti in the Greek, because connects verse 18 with the preceding paragraph. And so what we see here uh, are uh, two possibilities. Uh, Christ brought you to God uh, on the one hand by putting being put to death in the flesh, on the other hand by being made alive in the spirit. In the spirit, that in, in his spiritual existence, he went and preached, and that is not the word evangelize. It does not imply that people were giving an, given an opportunity to respond or not respond. It is more a proclamation. It is an announcement <coughs> in the spirit, in his spiritual existence, he went and preached to spirits in prison who disobeyed long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared. There are two basic theories that have been advanced concerning the teaching of this text. Number one, he preached to the spirits of uh, human beings who had died, human beings who lived in the time of Noah, but in the time of Peter had died. Hebrews 12, 23 would be a use of the word spirit with reference to human beings. And so one possibility is he was preaching to human beings, not for the purpose of converting them to Christ, to himself, but for the purpose of proclaiming uh, his victory. Uh, another possibility is that he was preaching through Noah, uh, in the time of Noah, we'll go through these in more detail. The second possibility in a general way is that he preached to the evil angels who are referenced in 2 Peter 2 verses 4 and 5 and Jude chapter uh, verse 6. And so what we would have uh, is something consistent with the uh, last verse of the uh, parentheses, who has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand with angels, authorities, and powers in submission to him. So the spirits to whom Jesus made proclamation were those who disobeyed in the time of Noah, and there are these four possibilities. Uh, just to uh, have them all in front of us, uh, one, the pre-existent Christ prior to his existence in the flesh, his fleshly existence, preached in the spirit through Noah to the people of Noah's day, the people who in Peter's day were imprisoned, uh, possibly by death. A second option, Christ between his death and resurrection in the spirit preached to those same people of Noah's day with the purpose of proclaiming his victory or the blessings on Noah and his family. Third option, Christ between his death and resurrection in the spirit went and preached to the angels who were imprisoned proclaiming his victory. And another possibility, Christ victorious in his ascension declared his victory to the imprisoned angels. Uh, so these are four possibilities that we might um, pursue. Now, which one of those makes the most sense? Uh, let me say before we complete our study of the text that what really appeals to me is the idea that we're talking about the angels, authorities, and powers that are described in chapter 3 and verse 22. The idea of Jesus going through whom also he went is the same word that is used in chapter 3, verse 22, that he has gone or went into heaven. Uh, and so the idea that Jesus uh, going uh, made proclamation, uh, a victory proclamation in his ascension, going into heaven, being at God's right hand, uh, angels, authorities, and powers in submission to him. Uh, now to understand the text further, uh, let's look at uh, 321, uh, which says that uh, baptism um, is uh, symbolized in water, or the NIV says this water symbolizes baptism. Uh, the point is this, if we look at the text literally, <laughs> it says 321, which also to you is an antitype. Excuse me a moment. 321, which also to you is an antitype, baptism now saves. The antitype is that which corresponds to the type. Uh, so the antitype uh, is, we might say, the actual point, and the type is a representation or a copy. So here is the key to understanding uh, the text. In verses 19 and 20, we have the type. Uh, that is the illustration. 
in 2021, we have the anti-type. So what is the point? The point is that the significance of baptism is not physical. It is not a cleansing in the flesh. The significance of baptism is spiritual, the response to God of a good conscience. So baptism saves through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, which would seem to me to connect with the made alive of verse 18. It is a declaration of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. Baptism declares the death of the old person, uh, an escape from the physical existence uh, that formerly characterized us, uh, living only for the flesh. And we'll see this described also in chapter 4, and now alive in the spirit. Uh, so the point is that God does his work as we look at God's action in our life. He does his work not through measuring the things that happen to us in the flesh, but the things that happen to us in the spirit. And this Jesus suffered in the flesh has now gone into heaven and by means of the ascension in the spirit is at God's right hand and all of the angels, authorities, and powers are submitted to him. Now all of that I think will make good sense when we come to chapter 4 and verse 1. As we've already noted, you can skip from 3.18 to 4.1 and don't lose anything. And so he was put to death in the flesh, made alive in the spirit. And since he suffered in the, excuse me, since he suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same attitude of Christ because the one who has suffered in the flesh is done with sin. So we have two occurrences of that phrase uh, in the flesh. Chapter 4 and verse 2, as a result, does not live life in the flesh for uh, evil human desires, but rather for uh, the will of God. And so what we have going on is that Christ suffered in the flesh. Christians must be prepared for the same experience in the flesh refers to physical life in this world. Because he suffered, we can expect suffering. That does not mean God has abandoned us. We arm ourselves with his attitude, his understanding, the understanding of Christ, and the one who suffers in the flesh then ceases from sin. We have been made alive spiritually. We've died to sin. We're done with sin. That would be also reflected in Romans chapter 6, Jesus died so we could cease from sinning. Chapter 2 and verse 24 of 1 Peter, and believers who follow Christ's example of suffering will also follow his example of victory over sin. So we no longer live the rest of our time in the flesh for the desires of men, but for the will of God. Now the point of all of that we see in verse 6, which reflects again preaching, but not the same verb. So here in chapter 4 and verse 6, we have the preaching of the gospel. The NIV says, for this reason, the gospel was preached. Uh, we have the word um, uh, that means evangelize. <coughs> and so we have a different word. We have proclamation or declaration in chapter 3. Here we have the preaching of the gospel. The focus is not on the who, but on the purpose of the preaching. The gospel was preached, the gospel was presented to people who have now died as a result of being persecuted uh, for the gospel. Uh, they had responded to the gospel before they died. The purpose of the preaching was so that human beings, even though they may be judged by other human beings with regard to their life in the flesh, may live according to God in the spirit. And so the way one measures life is not by what happens to us in the flesh, but by what happens to us in the spirit. So we could briefly summarize uh, this section of uh, chapter 3, 18 through 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 6 by saying Christ suffered to bring you to God, being put to death in the flesh, being made alive in the spirit. And so we in the same way arm ourselves as we live in the flesh. <coughs> so that we might cease from sin. Coming to chapter 4 and verse 2, we do not live our life in the flesh for evil human desires. Since Christ suffered in the flesh, we should follow him as an example that separates us from those about us, the reason for preaching the gospel, uh, even to those who have died as a result of persecution, is so that while human standards judge a person in the flesh, a person can live by God's standard. So here is a brief summary of what we've tried to say in the text of 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18 through chapter 4 and verse 6. Uh, Christ was put to death in the body, made alive in the spirit, 
It was in the spirit that he made proclamation to the spirits in prison, those who had formerly disobeyed in the time of Noah. Uh, and in that time of Noah, we can see the type and anti-type, uh, the importance of focusing on the spiritual realities and not on fleshly realities illustrated in baptism so that in his going, that even the angels, authorities, and powers are now in submission to him, and that by his resurrection being made alive in the Spirit, that he was declaring his ultimate victory. We imitate him in the same way as Christians, so that we too uh, are done with sin, so that we too live to please God and not to please others. So the focus of the passage is on in the Spirit, in the flesh and the best understanding is perhaps this that jesus made proclamation to the spirits in prison by means of his ascension after his resurrection referring to the disobedient spirits angels authorities and powers that his ascension into heaven was itself a victory proclamation May God bless us as we study God's Word. I hope that you'll contact me if you have further questions, that we might study God's Word and be blessed.